everybody. I hope you had a very Merry Christmas and of course a Happy New Year. And we can finally say goodbye to 2020 at last. Now, today I just wanted to cover a topic briefly uh, that I get asked actually a lot, which is about how to start a scratch build project. And it's something I've had on the back burner for a long time and I've wanted to share it for ages, but the moment has never quite come up. But now seems like the perfect opportunity, new year and all I can imagine, many people will be starting new projects. But before we do that, we have a bit of an issue because the workshop is completely full. Now I'm always banging on about how little space I have in the workshop, but there's also another side of the equation that I don't tend to mention, and that's the amount of space that I take up in the home. So normally all the things that really should go in there, like all the excess hardware and bits and bobs, have to stay in the house. But of course over Christmas, it meant that everyone's at home, and it doesn't seem right to pollute the house with all the junk, so I had to move it from there into the workshop and uh, yeah I can't even fit in it at the moment like take a look at this now look at that mess that's no good look, I can't even walk in got the charcoal down here and just about make out Ensis in the back there but look at all this stuff, I've got 3D printers, I've got gear, power supplies, additional tools. All this stuff does not have a proper space inside here, so we're going to have to move this out. Got Aquacara sitting in the back there, it will be used. But yeah, we need to do something about all of this before we can get to work on not only finishing up Ensis, but also today's video. So let's hop to that now. <laughs> is a little bit better don't you think still a bit chilly in here but it'll have to do for now so i just wanted to go over some of the points that i like to consider when i'm starting a scratch built project of my own because i do get asked an awful lot about this and so i think it's pretty fair because actually it's not the easiest thing to do especially if you're new to sort of modding and manufacturing and everything you're sort of doing it as a hobby um taking on an entire scratch build versus say a pc mod is quite a difficult concept and there's an awful lot to consider. So hopefully this will help you in your way if you're thinking of trying one yourself. Now first of all, I just want to apologize if my microphone is a little bit on the echoey side today. Um, I had a bit of an incident with my old microphone, so I'm using my backup. The old one has seemingly crapped out and I'm just replacing it. I absolutely hate it. It's a, a Sennheiser G4 setup and yeah, it wasn't cheap, but it's been horrible to use since day one and I just I'm just so fed up with it I mean you've heard me complain about it before so I'm done with that I've got a new one on the way a different system we're going to see how that turns out in future videos but for now we're going to be using my shotgun mic so everything will be a little bit roomy in here for the time being so where do we begin one. Now to me, the most important starting point of all is your concept, your idea, the reason why your scratch build needs to exist in the first place. And it's really important because it will guide all of the subsequent steps. If you have a clear idea of where you want to go, you'll have a much better idea of how to get there. And of course, there are lots of different reasons that are all incredibly valid. So you might be doing it to fit your hardware into a certain configuration. Maybe you want to fit a form factor or you want to try out a new technique, or maybe you just want to have a bit of fun with it and go kind of freestyle. These are all legitimate reasons, but you need to have a rough idea of what you want to do. And this will help prevent you from getting lost along the way. A lot of people get too bogged down on specifics a little bit early on. And I actually suggest you sort of step back Think about your inspiration, maybe jot it down, get some ideas, do a little bit of research and then flesh it out as much as you possibly can. And this part is crucial. The more robust your concept is, the much easier all the subsequent steps will become. And that leads us to point number two on my priority list. Now for me, the second step is always getting your design out of your head and onto paper. Now I'd choose this over CAD personally. Despite all the CAD that I do for the channel, I always prefer to have my designs in some kind of sketch format first. And the reason for that is it's very quick to make changes. Sometimes when you start putting things out of your head into the paper, even if it's just a quick napkin sketch, it doesn't have to be very good either. 
you start to sort of flesh out the ideas very quickly. And actually you can rapidly decide if something looks a bit silly or if it's not quite going to work out how you're intending. And it allows you that freedom to make changes on the fly that you just don't get with CAD. So one of the mistakes I see a lot of people make is they go straight into CAD and then they start going with all the details and things and it's too early. No, 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 you have to slow down do something just a little bit more vague first and then flesh it out in CAD later. Because if you start too early in CAD, you get bogged down in all the incorrect details. You've got to put things like fan spacing and where the motherboard goes and the power supply slots and all the tiny little details that aren't necessarily important to the overall structure, perhaps. They all need to be in there because that's just how CAD works. And what you'll end up doing is probably remaking the CAD file later on when all these things have sort of been put into their proper places, at which point, well, you may as well have just done it on a piece of paper or in a little booklet and recorded it and then done it afterwards. And that's the approach that I like to take. So I've got plenty of my sort of various designs that I've had in here. And some of these have become reality. Some of them I've shelved because I realized actually they're pretty rubbish. It's a Japanese design there. But that's part of the beauty of it. You get to choose all sorts of different things and mix and match. So I definitely recommend doing this. You don't have to be a Leonardo da Vinci. You just need to be able to put something on paper. And also the more you do it, the better you become, the easier it becomes to express oneself. So I definitely recommend doing that before jumping into anything like CAD. Three. All right, so we've now got a design on paper but we need to flesh it out even more. And this is where CAD really helps. And I like to do this in conjunction with a couple other things as well. So I like to consider what materials that I want to work with and how I'm going to work with them at this point, because it largely dictates my design. And it's quite important because for instance, what if you're working with metal? You're gonna have to consider about how you're going to be cutting that, how you're going to be working with it. What tools do you have access to? What services do you have access to if you don't have the tools? What about if you want to work with mahogany? What if you want to work with all sorts of stuff? It's all part of the equation. And this is the sort of thing that you can put into your CAD. Now, the way I like to work with it is I work from the components outwards quite often in my designs because I don't tend to work towards, say, a form factor, in which case you might want to work with a bounding box type shape and then sort of start assembling things in there. Now, I tend to choose my hardware first and then either source 3D models from the manufacturers if I'm fortunate enough, or I model them myself. Now, the reason why I do this is because I want to have complete faith in the models that I have and know that they're accurate. The problem with services like GrabCAD and Thingiverse is that Ultimately, you don't know the person who modeled that and you don't know how authentic it could be. So for instance, they may have modeled one part incredibly accurately because that's what they need, but they've put it up for download and actually maybe you need something which is completely different that they didn't care about and they haven't put that much thought into that segment. So you don't know what their priorities were and sometimes, just sometimes, they actually put purposeful mistakes in the model as well. So you want to keep an eye out for those. So things like inverted pins in the 24 pins on the, some of the famous GrabCAD models, things like that are noticeable and they do lead to incorrect measurements and similar problems. So don't rely too heavily on GrabCAD models. Personally, I like to make sure that they're all verified by me first with the real hardware before I commit to anything. That includes manufacturer diagrams I've often been sent things out maybe a different revision to the commercial product. So I have to double check everything anyway. Now, one thing I really do recommend you do is get to grips with using the ATX specification because this has a huge amount of information. And we do have a video on how to construct a motherboard tray from scratch that does go into using the ATX spec a little bit. Basically, you're going to have all the diagrams necessary for your motherboard trays, power supplies, things like that. And it has all the measurements for those sections, which can save you having to use a third party motherboard tray from an existing donor chassis, for instance, you can make your own if you just interpret the specification. Now, if you're used to working with engineering drawings, it'll all be very familiar. If that's new to you, then I definitely suggest spending a little bit of time watching maybe a few of the videos made by, by Lars Christensen on Fusion 360 on how that works. It's a really good topic to understand and it allows you to do some fantastic things in the future. 
So there's a huge amount of power to be had in the ATX spec, and that's how I get everything to line up in the way that I do. I tend to use all the ATX specification mounting holes, and then I model the hardware or download it if I'm sent it, and then I line everything up and double check everything that way. Now, supposing you have your fleshed out 2D or 3D plan, you probably want to get around to making your project itself. But how do you actually do that if you don't have a fully stocked up workshop? Well, there are a few considerations. Now, the first thing would actually be to assess what could be viable in the space that you have, because you might be surprised with how much you can actually do in a fairly straightforward residential setting. So for instance, you have access to all the abilities to do cabling from scratch. That can be done very easily, even in a bedroom. And you can do an awful lot more too. In fact, all of my first scratch builds were done either in a university dorm room or in the kitchen table or something at home before I had built this workshop. So it's really interesting to see how much you can get done in a small space with very little in the way of tooling. So definitely don't discount it. But another thing you definitely can consider is outsourcing. Now outsourcing gets a lot of bad rep from some people in this community, and I don't really know why. Because quite frankly, assuming everyone has to do everything from scratch by themselves is a bit of a stretch because people don't actually have access to things like this. What if you live in an apartment? Well, of course you can't have a CNC machine going along with all the glass blasting and the air compressors and big pillar drills. It's just not viable unless you have a truly enormous apartment that is but most people aren't in that position. However, it's very possible to outsource certain components to people who do or to businesses who offer that sort of service. I would definitely suggest having a good look around locally because you might well be surprised with how much is available in your area. There are quite often small businesses that have set up to cater to shops doing sign work, vinyl cutting, or even laser cutting services, and they often work in very built up residential areas even. Alternatively, there's also larger places that offer online services, although they do tend to be very pricey. There are also independent smaller businesses that operate online. And of course, you can look further afield. If you want to go global, it is very possible, especially on smaller items. Although quite often shipping and customs can become prohibitive if you want to have, say, CNC milling done abroad. I personally would recommend trying to get that done as locally as possible, especially since there's also the possibility of perhaps in this post COVID world, you could actually meet them. In addition to broader web searches, you can also do more targeted searches within, say, Facebook groups in the marketplace, Etsy, or local forums devoted to certain crafts, because sometimes you'll often find like-minded enthusiasts who are willing to help you out either for a small fee or even just for the experience of doing it. I do always recommend, though, please be fair and don't ask the earth of someone. It is actually a lot of work to have something cut out for you. So please do respect that somebody is giving you their time if they choose to work with you. And that's the way you do it. Now my parting point would actually be, don't worry if things don't go to plan. In fact, if anything, you should expect things not to go to plan, especially if it's your first time. Things are not easy. There's an awful lot to consider and there'll always be some tiny little detail perhaps that you might have overlooked. For instance, I've quite often forgotten drain systems or tiny little cables maybe for front panel connectors because I don't tend to think of them very much. These are the sort of things that very easily get left by the wayside. So don't worry if something goes wrong. It's all part of the process and you never know, next time you might actually be able to learn from it build it into your design and become that much more accomplished at the hobby. Now, before I head inside for the New Year's boom booms, I just wanna show you a couple cool things that came in whilst Ensys was going along, and I think you're gonna like these. So, firstly, we have a replacement radiator. So that is an Aqua Computer Airflex Radical, and we're gonna be plumbing this into the back where that Barrow one is currently. Hopefully that's gonna work. Very interesting uh, radiator design, and there's an awful lot that's going to have to go into that. Fingers crossed you can hear me over the fireworks in the background though. Now, in addition to that, one of the big things that was holding up the project was getting hold of a 3090. Ta-da! Well, I got myself a 3090 Founders Edition, and this should do me very nicely. Now, it's actually not in this box at the moment because I've got it in the rig upstairs doing rendering work, but rest assured, it is an absolute beast. It is beyond beautiful. I took some fancy photographs. We all know what they look like by now, but it really is such a beautiful cooler design. It's almost going to be a shame to put a water block on it, 
but not quite a shame. We've got a very special water block that's going to be going on this one eventually when it does arrive. So when I'm all finished with Ensis and we've got some other things going, we'll be able to settle into doing that and finish off Aquacaris at last. Now, speaking of... Oh, Speaking of finishing projects with the workshop nice and clear, I now need to get back to work on Insys and doing all the cable work and finishing up the loop. And that's going to be really quite a big one and then we can finally have it done. But of course, you would not want to miss the opportunity to see any of those future videos, now would you? And the best way to stay up to date is of course by subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. You can of course also find us over on Facebook, Instagram, builds.gg and Twitter. Our merchandise store is also linked below, so if you'd like to send any last minute gifts and just pretend that the postie was late, be sure to check that out and see if anything strikes your fancy. Take care folks, stay safe, happy new year, and I'll catch you next time.